If our task is to create conditions for the next generations, we must visualize how civilization works before we choose behaviors that create those conditions. However, the world is complicated. There are lots of cities, farms, manufacturing facilities, mines, wells, and many transportation systems. If this is your view of how things work, it gives no indication of where the world is going. To overcome the failure of vision, this video breaks the whole world into a few simple interacting chunks and uses them to show which behaviors create which conditions. Let me begin by using four simple machines to describe the whole world, humans, plants, weather, and animals. Plant machines convert sunlight into food. Weather machines convert sunlight into wind, rain, rivers, and valleys. Non-human animal machines convert solar-created food into meat. Human machines gather plants and animals and use them to replace worn-out machines. Using all the surface of the world, sunlight can support 100 million machines. The same sunlight can support 100 million hunter and gatherers. When human machines do more than hunt and gather, they also burn wood, plant crops, and domesticate animals. And this configuration spreads over the whole Earth. Sunlight supports 600 million. Next, imagine that each human machine has two attached tanks, something like your car's gas tank, one filled with coal, oil, gas, and uranium, and the other with minerals and metals. With these tanks, each human machine can provide more than a few replacement machines. They can produce goods and services. And they can produce machines that perform all kinds of additional processes. When the tanks of each machine is full, 7.8 billion of them can be productive on Earth. However, when any machine's tank runs dry, its production ends. Of the 7.8 billion machines, 600 million solar-powered machines keep producing, while 7.2 billion machines with empty tanks stop. To prevent this civilization contraction, some machines were set up to work extracting resources from the Earth's crust, transporting it, refining it, and piping it into their tanks. Some were set to work building and maintaining the supporting infrastructure, and some were set to work manufacturing replacement machines using crustal resources that tanks of 7.2 billion machines can be kept full. Sunlight supports the rest. However, there is a problem. These energy and material delivery machines were designed to do their extraction from the richest locations in the crust, those having the shortest transportation distance and those where it was the easiest to process. When these locations are mined out or pumped dry, the machines had to move their extraction activities to reservoirs and ore bodies that were deeper, smaller, and less dense. That required greater mining infrastructure, additional transport, and more processing. On this path to ever lesser quality mining sites means the consumption of the machines tasked with obtaining and delivering energy and materials eventually exceeds their production and their tanks are empty. While the 600 million sunlight-powered machines keep producing, everything else stops. Let's assume 
that the machines could foresee this decline in delivery of energy and materials to 7.2 billion machines and the contraction of their civilization. They try to create new machines like solar panels, wind turbines, and fusion reactors, and new infrastructure to support them. They hope this new production will replace the energy and materials that can no longer be delivered from the crust. However, if these efforts don't keep these tanks full, this machine civilization will contract to just the sun-powered machines. Now, does this simple, big chunk model help us see how our world works? Let's replace these machines with people. Earth is feeding 7.8 billion people. People are mining minerals and pumping energy reservoirs until they can't. The development of alternative energy and material delivery systems don't seem to be coming online fast enough. So in our future, maybe in 2100, when we cannot extract crustal resources, sunlight will feed 600 million people like 17th century serfs. Most of the global population that lives after 2050 will experience starvation. And during the next 80 years, 8 to 10 billion people could starve to death or die in conflict over food. Maybe this chunky model can tell us some other possible futures. In 2100, the sun will still be shining. Ocean water will still be evaporating. Rain will still be falling in the mountains. Rivers will still be filling existing reservoirs behind dams. These dams will still be creating enough electric power to allow 50 million people to live almost our present lifestyles. That is, if they will confine their homes to three specially designed cities located to obtain their energy from today's hydro dams and they will constrain their behavior as defined by some new social rules. These social rules have some other benefits. They prevent civilization from returning to bad conditions. Because civilization contraction does not include collapse, the arts and sciences are not lost and continue to advance, which means new energy sources might be implemented. The ecosystem can recover because of the footprint of 50 million people constrained to live in three city-states uses less than 2% of the globe's land area. 98% reverts to the state, resulting from no human inhabitants. During the contraction from 7.8 billion people to 50 million, the new social rules of behavior allow people to die of old age instead of starvation and conflict. In making these predictions, this chunky model has not included the effects of advancing technology. For example, dark energy or fusion energy deliveries change these predictions. However, should these advances not arrive on time, this chunky model predicts 7.8 billion sets of human behavior will determine if civilization contracts to either 600 million serfs or 50 million moderns. Humankind has the chance for a bright future. However, they have to choose behavior very carefully. Mm -hmm.